Welcome back, students. We're going to pick up kind of right where we left off here, estimating proportions, their confidence intervals, and doing sample size estimation from proportions. And it's going to be a lot like what we did with our point estimates. So it should go pretty quickly. So just by way of an overview, we're going to look at what a proportion is, how to do confidence intervals around a proportion. We're going to do an example of that. Then we're going to estimate sample size from a proportion, and we'll do an example of that. All right, let's begin. Remember, anything can be a proportion. A proportion is the success condition within our dichotomous variable. And because anything can be a dichotomy, anything can be a proportion. So you can think of a naturally occurring dichotomy as being, you know, gender, male, female. You can think of a proportion as being those who agree or strongly agree with a proposition. Or you can think of a proportion coming from interval ratio level data, those with three or more children, those with less than three children, etc. You can make a proportion or dichotomy out of anything. And a proportion, as I said, is just the proportion in the success condition. So if we observed 48% of our sample was female, the proportion of females is 0 0.48. Right? And like point estimates, we're going to estimate population proportions and confidence intervals around them. And the pattern of our formulas is essentially the same. So you can see we have a formula for standard deviation, which is relatively easy. It's just the square root of the proportion in our success condition multiplied by 1 minus the proportion in our success condition. So when we look at s equals the square root of p times q, p is the proportion in our success condition, and q is 1 minus the proportion in our success condition. We similarly have proportion standard error calculated, which is going to be essentially similar to our standard deviation estimate, but proportional to the sample to the amount of sample that we've collected all right good job so here's how we calculate the standard error of a proportion remember p is the sample proportion that we've observed q is 1 minus p right so if we have 30 percent in our proportion that means we have 1 minus 30 percent or 1 minus 0.3 or 0.7 or 70 percent in our fail to succeed condition right so in that case p would be 0.3 and q would be 0.7 and n is just the sample size you've observed and what we're going to do is exactly the same structure to building our confidence interval where we have our proportion which is similar to our point estimate then we're going to have a plus or minus term where we have the z-score at the given confidence level that we're interested in times the standard error of our proportion so here's how it works let's take a look in a sample of 800 virginians 40% say that they would vote yes on a decision to repeal the conceal and carry law. Let's build a 95% confidence interval around this. So 0.4 is our proportion, right? 40% as a proportion is 0.4. Then we're going to have plus or minus 1.96, which was our z-score for 95% confidence, multiplied by the standard error of our proportion. Remember, the standard error is the square root of pq over n. So we have 0.4 times pu 0.6 divided by 800, and we're going to take the square root of all of that. And that would leave us with 0.4 plus or minus our z-score times our standard error, or 0.4 plus or minus 0 0.0339. And we can then calculate an upper bound and a lower bound estimate. The upper bound is 0 0.4 plus our 0 0.0339, which is our margin of error, and our lower bound is 0 0.4 minus 0 0.339. And so you can see that our lower bound of 0.3661 and our upper bound of 0.4339 allows us to make a statement that we could be 95% confident that the true proportion of Virginians that would vote yes on the, to repeal the conceal and carry law lies somewhere between 36.6 and 43.3%. So here's another way to think about it. All right, you could imagine that what we're trying to do is identify those points in the curve that will allow us two and a half percent probability in each of the tails. So here's an example using Obama job approval. So we have our proportion plus or minus our z-score, whatever confidence level we want, times our standard error of our estimate. And you can see I have uh, n equals 500, 44 percent approve of the job Obama is doing, and we want to be 95 percent confident. So my proportion is 0 0.44 plus or minus 1.96 times our standard error. And once you do that calculation, you determine that you're 95% confident that the proportion of all Americans that approve the job Obama is doing is between 39.7% and 48.4%. Outstanding. Just remember that the margin of error term 
is the plus or minus term in the proportion. So margin of error is the plus or minus the z-score times the standard error. The interesting thing is, much like our point estimate formula, we can manipulate this to solve for n. So if we have a standard deviation that we're working from, in fact, and because we don't have a standard deviation proper, if we just have a proportion that we're working from, we can estimate how much sample we would need to estimate something. What's fascinating about this is you can see that the variation is maximized. You get maximum variation as the proportion that you're observing gets closer to 0.5 or 50%, or something being just as likely to be observed versus not being observed. Part of that is something that you can just infer analytically, because if we know that the standard deviation, for example, is the square root of p times q, as p increases, q decreases, and as q increases, p decreases. So there's a maximum possible value. For example, if p equals 0.5, q is 0.5. And if p is 0.75, q is 0.25. But if the reverse is also true, you can see where p is 0.2, q is 0.8, etc. I think you guys can see what I'm doing. So it creates this distributional shape. Now, what you also see in this table is that we have uh, the 90 in the blue bars, the 95% confidence, and the 99% confidence in the red bars. And so you can see that there's a maximum amount of sample you would need to observe depending on how confident you want it to be and the underlying proportions that are present in the population. And in fact, even if we don't understand the standard deviation or the proportion that exists in the population, we know if we just guessed or took what's called an ignorance assumption, we can make a claim that we would maximize variation where a 50% probability of something happening versus not happening would be our best guess. That would just maximize variation. How much sample would you need to estimate the percentage of high school students who've ever used drugs within a plus or minus four percentage point margin of error with 99% confidence if, based on a previous study, you believe the percentage is around 30%? Well, we just need to populate the z value, the p, the q, and the margin of error. And we have all of that in this paragraph. So for example, the z value is, we derive that from our confidence. We want to be 99% confident, so our z score is 2.575. The proportion that we're trying to estimate is the 30%. 30% as a proportion is 0 0.3. Now that also gives us q, because we know that q is 1 minus p, and 1 minus 0.3 is 0.7, so therefore p is 0.3 and q is 0.7. Finally, we also said plus or minus 4 percentage points. That's our margin of error. When our margin of error is uh, 4 percentage points, we're saying p is 0 0.04. So now we just solve the formula, and you can see that that all works out to 870.19. Again, like our, like our sample size estimates from point estimations, with proportions, we also round up. Otherwise, we'd be sacrificing either the level of confidence that we have or the margin of error we're willing to tolerate. So we round up, in this case, 870.19 becomes 871. And finally, we could make a statement where we would need a sample of 871 high school students to estimate drug use within a 4% margin of error with 95% confidence. Fantastic. So we've looked at what proportions are, confidence intervals around proportions. We've done a couple of examples, and we've estimated sample sizes. So that kind of concludes where we are with univariate analysis. And after we take a short break with our midterm, we're going to come back and get into bivariate estimation and hypothesis testing. Great job, guys. We'll talk to you soon.